Very happy to see each of you here this morning as we open the Word of God. Our theme for this conference has been that Christ is our all and in all. This morning we're going to talk about all for Christ. Now I have a question for you. How many of you have given your all to Jesus? Now, have you given your all to Christ? It's a very important question for us to evaluate if we have given our all for Jesus. This morning I'd like us to talk a little bit about a man also who had given his all for Jesus. We've been talking in the last few studies about Peter as the disciple. In Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 20, Peter was one of the very first disciples that was called to be a disciple. His calling was very important. In Desire of Ages 291, it says there that the calling of the ministry, the calling of apostleship, is second only to that of Christ himself. And Jesus invited Peter to be an apostle. Peter had a deep experience with Christ. I know many times we talk about Peter was unconverted. But I don't believe for a moment that Jesus would call an unconverted person, ordain him to the ministry, and say, be a minister. I don't believe that for a moment. Judas pushed himself in. Judas was unconverted, and he insisted on being an apostle. Peter was invited by Jesus Christ. Peter had a faith in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, when we look at verses 13 to 17, Jesus asked the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter was very clear on who Jesus was. It goes on in the next verses that Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had the assurance in Jesus as the Messiah. He had the assurance in Jesus as the truth. Jesus said later on, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Peter had the confidence that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Messiah. In order for Peter to clearly understand the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, he had to have a connection with divinity. In verse 17 it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, Peter had a relationship with divinity. How do we know that for certain? Desire of Ages 412 states, never can humanity of itself attain to a knowledge of the divine. And Peter had the knowledge of the divine, and God had revealed himself to him. And while he had the knowledge of the divine, what is knowledge of divinity? What does it say there in John 17? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In other words, Peter knew the Messiah. Peter had eternal life. When people began to leave, you know, when people are coming together, it's, it's easy to have a, to say, Let's, I'm going to join too. You know, when people are moving in and the, the truth is happening and 
the evangelistic meeting is happening and people stand up and they say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. It's easy to stand up and say, yes, I want to be counted. But what happens when people begin to leave? What happens when people say, no, this is not for me? In John chapter 6, verse 66 to 68, it says many of the disciples walked away from Jesus. But what about Peter? When Jesus says to the disciples, are you going to go away as well? Who was ready to make an answer? Verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I don't understand why people are leaving. I don't understand why people are giving up. I don't understand why the message is being dropped by individuals who have fervently accepted it for years. But I know one thing. What is that? That you have the words of eternal life. In reality, it says in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 291, that Peter had great faith in Jesus. Yes, Peter had great faith in Jesus. He was the only disciple that at least was willing to get out on the water and walk on water. But, what, but Peter had a problem too, and we'll get to that in a moment. It goes on in the same statement. It says that he was convinced that he was the Son of God. And I want you to notice this. But the faith of Peter never flagged. What does that mean? He was confident in Jesus as the Messiah. He never lost that confidence. We need to understand something. Peter was not Judas. Peter was not Caiaphas. Peter was not Pilate. Peter was a devout follower of Jesus Christ. Peter accepted the standards that Jesus gave. And even before the denial of Christ that we all remember, in John chapter 13, it's quite interesting in the upper room, when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples, Peter said, no, no, I don't deserve to have my feet washed by you. And Jesus explains the necessity of that ceremony. And it's interesting in verse 10, John chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, he that is what? He that is what? He that is washed needeth not save the washer's feet. What does that mean? Was Peter clean or was he not clean? Clearly, he was clean. But now I want to take you to something else. I want you to think about something else because there is something called the denial that he had. And this is something for you and me. This experience is not for someone out there. This experience is for the disciples. This experience is for the apostles. This experience is for you and me as reformers. And why is it that Peter denied Christ? I mean, can you imagine, because Peter was a, officer of the general conference. Judas was the treasurer of the general conference. Can you imagine a general conference officer cursing and swearing? What would that do to your faith? What would that do to your experience? Well, Peter was just that type of individual. And why is it? Because you and I need to learn a lesson and if we don't learn the lesson early, we're going to learn it when it becomes really hard. Why? 
in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. Here is a lesson for you and me. Here is a lesson for every single reformer. Here is a lesson for every single uh, professor of the name of Jesus Christ. Here is a message for every single minister. Here is a message for every single general conference officer. Jeremiah 17, 5, Curse, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. What happens when you trust in a human being? I don't care what that human being may be. You know, sometimes people look at other human beings and they say, how can such an individual dress like that? How can such an individual eat like that? How can such an individual live like that? It's quite simple. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. You see, we have to come to a point in our experience where Christ is all and in all. And you know, we often use the failures of others to excuse our own mistakes. How can this be the church of God if so-and-so did that? How can we do this? How? And what do we do? Well, if they can do it, so can I. But what we're saying is, if they can go to hell, so can I. But you know what? Christ is our perfect pattern. And you and I, if we just look at Jesus, we're going to lose the confidence that we have in ourselves. In the book Ministry of Healing, on page 486, it says we are prone to look to our fellow men for sympathy and uplifting instead of looking to Jesus. Listen to this. In his mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us. God is merciful to you and me in order to allow people that we put our confidence in to fail us. Why? In order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Are we trusting in humanity? You know, Matthew 26, verse 31 this was given to me as the key text, and uh, it's quite an interesting verse. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Who is going to be offended? Which one of the disciples was not offended? Which one? Was John offended? Was John offended that night? You know, we talk about, oh, Peter did it. It says here, every one of them did it. This is you and me when we are standing on our own. But Peter was confident. See, his problem came because he was very outspoken in his confidence. In verse 33, Matthew 26, 33, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. How many of us have said that? How many of us have made the pledge, I'm going to be faithful to the truth till the day I die? And it reminds me of the pledge that Seventh-day Adventists made when they were first organized. This was our forefathers. This was you and me. They're stating that we pledge ourselves. We enter into a covenant relationship with God to keep His commandments. How many of you when you are baptized, pledge that you're going to be faithful to God till the day you die. How many of us have done that? How many of us then enter into pledges and accords? We made the accord in Porambaku. Let us pledge that we're going to be a faithful people, that we're going to stand for the truth, that we're going to uplift all the standards, Let's make another resolution that we're going to be faithful. And how long does it last? 
You see, this is our problem. Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. We say this over and over and over again. And so what do we experience? We experience something called failure over and over and over again. Now this verse that we just read, let's put it back up here, Matthew 26, 33. Though all men shall be offended, yet will I, yet will I never be offended. Now I want you to look at something. You know, we read this verse, we know this verse, but what about verse 35? What does verse 35 say? Likewise also said all the disciples. And what is this? Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Yeah, we read the statements in volume 5 where it says that, that um, the, the only ones who will be found faithful are those who would rather die than perform a wrong act. We read all those statements and we make those pledges. And we have failure. That's what we have. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. This is why. We are standing and this is our problem. We think we are standing. We think we have made it. We think we have arrived. We have finally come into the reform movement. This is the greatest thing on earth. This is the people of God. And now I am safe and secure. Until the first temptation comes and we find that we are nothing but flesh. In the youth instructor, it says, for the self-confident, there is a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. Who is this talking about? I've heard people preach and say, you know, I need to speak to those who are proud because God has blessed me with the gift of humility. I've actually heard this from the pulpit. What a tragedy. For the self-confident, there is a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation. And so what did Jesus do? In Matthew 26, 34, Jesus gave him a warning. And why did Jesus give him a warning? In the Review and Herald, it tells us that Jesus knew Peter much better than the disciple knew himself. You know the story. You find this in Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 to 74, where Peter denied Christ. In verse 72, it goes on, he again denies him and he begins to start swearing it goes down, he begins to curse and to swear. This is a minister, by the way. This is a general conference officer. This is one of the leaders of the early Christian church. This is you and me. Yeah, this is you and I. How many of us, have we looked back at our own experience from the day of baptism, how many of us have had failure? Those of you who have not had failure, that is a failure because you don't know yourself. We're comparing sometimes ourselves among ourselves, and we like to see worse people off because if they can be bad, then I look good. But you know, this morning, I'm not here to talk to you only about failure. I want to talk to you a little bit about the path to victory. Sorry. The path to victory. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 34, Jesus warned Peter. 
He said, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let's talk a little bit about this. You see, Peter was confident. And Jesus still had confidence in Peter. Can you imagine failing and someone has confidence in you? You know, it's like a, a music teacher. Music teacher listens to you play something, and what do they hear? <laughs> what do they hear? They hear mistakes. They hear errors. And what do they do? You can do it. Try again. Yeah? You can do it. I mean, stop and think. When you listen to someone play for the very first time a musical instrument, I mean, even practicing, sometimes, you know, people are practicing, and especially the violin, you know? People are practicing, and it sounds like a cat yelling, crying out. And uh, how many parents say, oh, no, I can't have them play that. It sounds terrible. But you know that? If they do that, they're not going to get too far. But there are parents that are encouraging their children, yeah, keep playing. Sounds really good, you know? <laughs> But Jesus is doing that with us. How about you and me with each other? Jesus had confidence in Peter. He says, when? He says, what? I, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And then he says, and when thou art converted. Does that mean Peter was never converted? No, we got to understand something. We just read a few minutes ago in John chapter 13 that a few hours before his denial, Jesus says, you are clean. That means even when God pronounces us clean, Jesus was God in human flesh. Jesus was God with us. He is Emmanuel. He is eternal God, and he pronounced him clean, but that does not guarantee anything two hours later. Not even a minute later. You know, we can never trust ourselves. You see, what Jesus meant in that verse when you compare all the scriptures together, and here's the beautiful thing in volume 3, page 416, but afterwards, re he rep afterwards repented and was what? And was what? Reconverted. In other words, you and I cannot be confident. We cannot be secure even for one moment. And when the rooster crowed, when the rooster finally gave the announcement, this is it, this is the sign, Peter remembered. What caused people, Peter, to remember? You know, the rooster crowed. Peter thought about something. He remembered. He realizes what I have done. Peter was now, what on earth did I do? Do you have those moments? If you don't, you're not, act, you're not analyzing yourself carefully. Peter looked at, what on earth did I do? And you know, in Luke chapter 22, it says, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately when he yet spake, the cock crew. And verse 61, it says here that when the rooster crowed, Peter looked to where Jesus was at and said, What did I do? And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Brethren, this is the most beautiful experience in the Bible. Why? Again, in Review and Herald, at his third denial of his Lord, the cock crew, and Jesus turned his eyes upon Peter with a look of peculiar sadness. 
and the words that Christ had spoken to him came quickly to his mind. All through his life, the memory of that look was with Peter. Brethren, have you had that look with Jesus? Yeah, we have our standards and many of us are failing over and over and over again. But have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus looking at you? His sinful boasting, his Lord's warning, his denial of the Savior, all came to him like a flash of lightning. And casting one pitiful look upon his suffering, insulted Lord, he hurried away from the sound of false accusations and reproach, rushed from the palace, plunged into the darkness, and weeping bitterly, hurried to Gethsemane. What did Peter do? You see, it was the look of Jesus. It was the look of compassion. It was the look of the Savior. You and I, many of us here are ministers in the church. Many of us are here are working directly with souls on a daily basis. Have you had the experience so that when a sinner sins and they have the look, when they look at us, do they see the look of Jesus full of compassion or do they find judgment and hellfire? Do they find the experience of John Wesley telling everybody, as we heard it in the divine service, telling everybody that God hates sinners? Or do we find a compassionate, loving Savior who came to seek and to save that which is lost? My dear brethren, what we need is to be hurried into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he began to see himself as he really was. This is our problem. We boast. We talk about the standards. We talk about lifting up the standards, and we fall on something bigger sometimes. You know, how many of us go through that? And I'm not, please, those of you who know me, I'm not minimizing the standards. We need to uplift them, but we need to uplift them with care that Jesus had. We need to have the experience of Jesus who is willing to take a harlot like Mary Magdalene who fell several times as he's working with her. And each time, what does he say? What does he say? Does he condemn her? Until she finally has that deep experience with Christ when he can finally say, go and sin no more. But it was not because of thundering at her, it was because he actually cared for her. When you and I begin to see ourselves as we really are, then and only then can we be proper ministers of Christ. Memory was alive and his sins were pictured before him in all their heinous light. Peter threw himself on the spot where a few hours before Jesus had prayed and wept in agony, and there the disciple prayed as he never prayed before. No more was he sleepy. Before that, he was exhausted. Now he prayed as never he prayed before. You and I need that experience. You and I need our personal Garden of Gethsemane. Have you been to Gethsemane? Have you had that experience where you surrender yourself fully to the Lord again? Right now, you look at your own experience. Are you neglecting things? Whether it's dress reform, whether it's health reform, whether it's moral issues, whether it's your job, maybe God is asking you to give up everything to follow Him. You have plans, you have goals, you have ideas for your life, and then there's missionary school. So, oh, I got other plans, I got other things for my life. We need a Garden of Gethsemane with deep repentance and terrible remorse. He pleaded for forgiveness and he rose 
the converted man. But he felt that although Jesus would forgive him, he could never forgive himself. Why did he have to go through this? Why do you and I have to go through failure? You know, Romans 8, 28 is very clear. All things work together for good to those that love God. Why? Because God is trying to save us. God is trying to save you and me. In Desire of Ages, when Peter said he would follow his Lord to prison and to death, he meant every word of it. Do you mean every word of it? Yes, we do. But he did not know himself. Hidden in his heart were elements of evil that circumstances would fan into life. And unless he was made conscious of his danger, these would prove ruin to eternal life. I remember the story of a man. He was driving a big truck and there was a little boy crossing the road on his bicycle and the man stops for the little boy. And the little boy looks at him and says, thank you very much. And he starts crossing the road and the truck driver stuck the thing in gear and run him over. Little boy was furious. He didn't get hurt, okay? He fell off. He got a few scratches and bruises. He was so mad at him. Why did you do that for me? Why did you let me go across and you run me over? And the uh, truck driver says, because I was looking in my rearview mirror and there was a car going fast and it was passing me. And in order to save you, I had to push you down. You're not that hurt, but I had to get you on the ground because once you get there, you're going to die. You and I are going to die from many things and God allows us to go through the Peter experience so that you and I can go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember the story where it says there that, that Peter was restored. How was he restored? In John chapter 21, in John chapter 21 verses 15 to 19, Jesus says to him, lovest thou me more than these? The question was, do you love me? That was the big question. And the big question for you and me is, do we love Jesus? In Acts of the Apostles, page 515, it says, Christ mentioned to Peter only one condition of service, lovest thou me. This is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other, yet without the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the flock of God. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, zeal are all essential in the, work of, in the work. But without the love of Christ in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. What about you? What is your experience? The question for us today is, have you had your Garden of Gethsemane? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 35, Peter said, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said also the, all the disciples. That's you and me. And what do we need instead? We need to be crucified with Christ. We need the Garden of Gethsemane. We need the cross of Calvary. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Is there a cross in your life today? That cross may be anything. We mentioned some of the things a few moments ago. I don't care what it is. Is there a cross right now in your life? Right now, that cross that seems unbearable to bear? You say, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. You know, I found the statement volume eight. It's the most beautiful statement. It says, we are in this world to lift the cross of self-denial. And I want to tell you something. The cross that's in your way, Sometimes some of you are struggling something for years, the same thing over and over again. It says, as we lift this cross, we shall find that it lifts us. Do you want that experience? Then you need to come to the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is inviting you right now Jesus is inviting you
to come to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is giving you and me an opportunity this morning to surrender our heart fully to Jesus as our personal Savior. The question is, have you had your Gethsemane? Have you had that experience in your life where you finally see yourself as you really are in need of a Savior? May the Lord help us this morning that today you, today I, may fall on the rock and experience the Garden of Gethsemane. Amen.